Now we have seen what a react reflex is, and we have examined some of the basic types. So for example, we have reflexes that are categorized by when they develop, either as an H, which are genetically determined or acquired, in that they're learned. We also have categorization depending on what system they're going to affect. Somatic reflexes will innervate skeletal muscle and cause contractions in skeletal muscle. Visceral reflexes will innervate visceral effectors such as glands, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and so forth. Monosynaptic ones are ones that only have one synapse in the circuit. Polysynaptic have multiple synapses. Spinal reflexes are processed within the spinal cord. Cranial re reflexes are processed within the brain. Now obviously these divisions can overlap one another. So for example, we can have one reflex that we'll look at next called a stretch reflex that will be an innate reflex. It's somatic because it will affect skeletal muscles. It's monosynaptic and it will be processed entirely within the spinal cord. We could also have, for example, a visceral reflex that would be a learned reflex. So for example, if we look at one of the famous experiments done in psychology of Pavlov's dogs. So Pavlov was a psychologist who basically taught dogs to pair the ringing of a bell with the anticipation of food. So he would ring a bell and shortly thereafter present the animals with food. And after several pairings of this, the animals would automatically start to salivate when they heard the bell in anticipation of the food. Now this was a visceral reflex, but it was a learned reflex. And likewise, we could have somatic reflexes that would be learned reflexes. For example, putting on the brakes when some uh, deer runs out in front of your car, this kind of thing. All right, well, let's look at some of the types of reflexes that we're going to see. Uh, polysynaptic reflexes have multiple synapses in the circuit and it may involve more than one segment of the spinal cord. So, so our simplest reflexes, such as our monosynaptic reflexes, typically take place at one spinal cord segment, whereas polysynaptic reflexes may involve several segments of the spinal cord and several different areas of the body. So the simplest reflex we can look at is called the stretch reflex. And basically this is to prevent the muscle, a muscle, from being overstretched, torn, or pulled apart. So a stretch reflex prevents damage to a muscle. And it is a monosynaptic reflex that's going to take place at the same spinal segment. And one of the most famous ones is the patellar reflex, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And this reflex is very, very quick to happen and happens in 20 to 40 milliseconds. And to give you an idea, 100 milliseconds is a tenth of a second. So these reflexes are completed in less than one half of one tenth of a second. So less than one twentieth of a second. And we have a specialized receptor called a muscle spindle that mediates this reflex. So a first let's talk about what the patellar reflex is. The patellar reflex happens when somebody taps on the patellar tendon. So typically this is a test we see in the doctor's office where the doctor will take the, the reflex hammer, hit the patellar tendon, and that's going to cause a very sudden stretch in the quadriceps muscle. And we have this receptor called the muscle spindle. And the muscle spindle lies deep within the muscle belly. And it has these special fibers called intrafusal fibers. And the fibers that surround it are called extrafusal. And these are basically the muscle fibers that we're used to seeing, our typical muscle cells. But we have some collagen in here, and we have some sensory receptors that are wound around some of this elastic tissue. And we've got sarcomeres on either end of it. And basically, when we get a sudden stretch, we're going to pull this tissue in the middle. And that's going to excite these dendrites of this receptor. And then that's going to send a signal, an afferent signal, to the spinal cord. And that afferent neuron will synapse directly on one of the alpha motor neurons that's going to control the extrafusal fibers or the fibers of the muscle. And that's going to cause them to suddenly shorten. It's going to cause them to shorten suddenly. So that will prevent overstretching of the muscle.
and this is important to prevent damage. Now typically a hammer is not going to cause damage if it taps your patellar tendon, but just imagine that you had something that was exerting a lot more force here. So let's say you're tripping over something and you want to prevent your quadriceps muscle here from being pulled too far. So this is a good example of when the stretch reflex would be initiated. So what it does is it's going to cause a sudden contraction of the muscle and then the foot will kick out. So the muscle spindles themselves are very specialized receptors and not only do they mediate the stretch response, the stretch reflex, but they're also going to give information about the state of contraction that the muscle is already in. So if I'm holding my hand like this and I have a bent arm and my biceps brachii are partially contracted, then that muscle spindle is going to be sending information about how much contraction is already occurring in that muscle. And that way, if some, suddenly someone slaps my hand or drops a heavy weight into it, then that muscle will be able to respond with the appropriate force to maintain the tension and prevent it from being stretched. And so that stretch is being sensed by these intrafusal fibers. And the surrounding fibers that are actually going to cause the muscle to contract are called extrafusal muscle fibers. And this is what's going to maintain the, the muscle tone and cause the muscle contraction. But we're going to have some of these intrafusal fibers as well. And they have a special type of motor neuron called a gamma efferent. And these are going to be gamma motor neurons here. And this is going to be important because this is constantly going to adjust the length of these intrafusal fibers so that that will tell us information about how much our muscle is stretched. So while the stretch reflex is going to innervate, obviously, the extrafusal fibers to prevent the muscle from being overstretched, we're also constantly going to be in adjusting the intrafusal fibers well to give us information about how much tone or how much contraction is in the muscle. So that whenever a force is applied on the muscle, whether it's stretched already or whether it's partially contracted, it will know exactly how much force to counteract that stretch with. All right, stretch reflexes are important in postural reflexes because as you can imagine, if you start to fall over, let's say that you're standing in line and all of a sudden your, your calves start to stretch, well, then they will immediately contract and pull you more upright. And if you were to sway backwards, the muscles of your shins, like your tibialis anterior and the muscles of the anterior thigh, will be stretched and then they will immediately adjust and pull you back upright so that you'll be maintaining your normal upright posture. And this is going to help you maintain balance automatically and prevent you from falling over. And this is happening several times a second. In fact, the postural muscles like the soleus, for example, are very, very good at this. And this reflex is very fast in them. And they're constantly making adjustments to your posture without you even thinking about it. So they're constantly contracting. Now let's look at some polysynaptic reflexes. And these are going to have more than one synapse in the circuit. And we're probably going to have several segments of the spinal cord involved as well. We're going to have some excitatory postsynaptic potentials that are going to affect muscles that we want to contract. And then some might be inhibitory so that they will actually inhibit the opposing muscle growth. So for example, with our withdrawal reflex that we saw earlier when we pulled our hand away from the tack, our flexors will be contracting. But we have to release any tension on the extensors like the triceps here to prevent the arm from locking up because what we want to do is to be able to withdraw that hand from the stimulus and that withdrawing action will be done by our flexor muscles here so we don't want any interference from the extensors which would prevent those muscles from flexing. So a polysynaptic reflex as we will see is going to have several components to it. We have another type of reflex called a tendon reflex. And this is a little bit different from a stretch reflex. This is going to prevent you from breaking or tearing tendons by developing too much muscle tension in your muscles. So for example, if you are doing say biceps curls and you're putting too much tension on the muscles and you're about ready to break the tendon, then the tendon reflex is going to relax the muscle. And unfortunately, far too many bodybuilders will 
break the biceps tendons because they're putting too much tension on the biceps muscles and they kind of override this reflex. So basically this is going to prevent too much pressure or too much tension on the tendon so that it doesn't become torn or broken or pull away from its insertion point. All right, now let's look at some withdrawal reflexes. We've already seen one, that flexor reflex that pulled the hand away from the, the tack, or in some cases it could be a hot stove or some other noxious stimulus. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that these reflexes can vary a little bit. So here's our hot stove. Here's our hot pan. And here somebody is touching the hot pan. They're getting the information about the noxious stimulus. That information will synapse first on an interneuron. That inner neuron will distribute the information. So first, that inner neuron is going to stimulate or excite a motor neuron. So we're going to have an efferent neuron that is going to stimulate our flexor muscles, so our biceps, brachii, and our brachialis, and so forth. And we're going to pull the hand away. But at the same time, that inner neuron will stimulate a neuron that will inhibit the opposing motor neuron. So in other words, we're going to stimulate an inhibitor that will prevent the triceps and extensor muscles from flexing. So that allows, or I should say from contracting, so that will allow for smooth response by the biceps without any intervention from the opposing muscle groups. At the same time, the inner neuron is sending information that's going to ascend to the spinal cord, and that will eventually reach our, or send the spinal cord to the brain, I should say, and that will eventually reach our, con reach our conscious awareness. That's going to say, hey, there's a hot stove there. Maybe we need to turn that off. So we're going to have several levels of this reflex. So we've got first the withdrawal reflex. We also have what we call um, an, an inhibition of the extensors. So we're going to inhibit the extensors. And at the same time, we're going to be sending information that will take a little bit longer to be processed. It's not part of the actual reflex, but we'll become aware of what just happened after we withdrew our hand so that we can then take care of the situation and turn off the stove. All right, so for this reflex to work, we're going to have to inhibit the antagonistic muscles. This is called reciprocal inhibition because we're inhibiting the extensors so that we can allow the flexors to work. And this can be mediated by a few levels of the spinal cord. And as we see, when we get even more complicated reflexes, then we'll have several levels of the spinal cord involved, and we'll even be involving opposite sides of the spinal cord. So for example, we will have um, in contralateral reflex arcs, that is ones that involve both sides of the body, we're going to have something called a cross extensor reflex. Now ipsilateral reflexes are things that occur entirely on the same side of the body as the stimulus. So ipsy means on the same side. So ipsilateral on the same side. We've already seen two. We've seen the stretch reflex. We've seen the tendon reflex. And also the withdrawal reflex that we examined with taking the hand away from the stove is a, an ipsilateral reflex because it's happening entirely on that side. But as I say, when we get to more complicated reflexes, we have what's called a crossed extensor reflex. And this is what we call a contralateral reflex because it will usually involve one side of the body doing one thing and the opposite side of the body doing the opposite. So let's take an example. Here we have a noxious stimulus. And this time, instead of putting our hand on attack, we're stepping on attack. So one foot is going to receive the painful stimulus. And that painful stimulus will be carried on a sensory afferent, which will bring that information to the spinal cord and it'll synapse on an inner neuron. And that inner neuron will basically inhibit the extensors and will, will excite the flexors. So our flexors are going to be our biceps femoris and our semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and so forth. So basically our hamstring group. So we're going to flex our leg and pull it away from this thing. In order to flex, in order to flex these muscles, we have to inhibit the extensors, which would be our in this case, our quadriceps. So what's going to happen is we have first a, an, a reciprocal inhibition happening here on the same side, but then on the opposite side of the spinal cord, 
we have to have exactly the opposite happen. So the opposite leg is going to have to carry the body weight. So our body weight was on this foot, and now we pull it away because if we stepped on the noxious stimulus, and now we are going to have to stimulate the extensors on this leg, so the quadriceps group, while inhibiting the hamstring group. So what that allows us to do is cause a flexion away from the stimulus on the leg that was affected while extending the opposite foot so that we can now carry our body weight. So we can see that we have what well, we have a contralateral response and that we have involved both sides of the spinal cord. At the same time, we have an interneuron that's going to send that information up to the brain and tell us, hey, there's a noxious stimulus there. So we're going to look down and see that tack after the fact, after the reflex has already protected us from it. And then we can pick up the tack and put it somewhere where someone else doesn't step on it. All right, so we're going to have five characteristics of polysynaptic reflexes. And the polysynaptic reflexes are pretty much anything but the stretch reflex that we've seen so far. So they're going to involve more than one set of interneurons. We're going to have pools of interneurons that are going to be distributing this information. We're going to have multiple segments of the spinal cord that are going to be involved. We're going to involve reciprocal inhibition so that we have the antagonistic muscle groups will be inhibited. We're also going to have a reverberating circuit, which is going to prolong this motor response for as long as it's necessary. And sometimes what we're going to see is when we have complicated reflexes, we're going to have several reflexes cooperating. And it's sort of what we see here. We've got a flex reflex here and an extension reflex here going on at the same time, coordinated via this, these inner neurons here. All right. So one of the things we will see is that a lot of our reflexes are automatic. All of our reflexes are automatic. However, we will see that these basic patterns can be co-opted by higher centers and built into more complicated movement patterns. So for example, if we have things like walking, which are ingrained motor, motor movement patterns, these things can be built on basically reflexes. So extending one leg and flexing the other leg. And so if we just basically keep cycling through these reflexes, we can create meaningful motor movement patterns that are going to be under our conscious control so that we can initiate walking and continue walking for as long as we consciously want to do it. Now, one of the things that's important is that we can take these very simplistic patterns and build them into more complicated patterns and one thing that's interesting to note is that in humans, we have to initiate walking and running consciously. If you took a cat, literally, and cut its head off and put it on a treadmill and started the treadmill, the cat would still continue to walk. As long as you used the spinal cord and kept the body alive, just that sensory information would be enough to cause the cat to walk. The sensation of the belt moving under the cat's feet, even if you cut the head off. In humans, we don't have that level of, of, of subconscious control, but basically these patterns such as walking, jumping, dancing, all of these things will be built from these very simplistic reflex patterns. So another thing we can do is reinforce our spinal reflexes, and we can do this several ways. We can either anticipate a spinal reflex. So for example, let's say you're playing a game, and you're playing the slap the hands game you can actually make your reflexes slightly faster. You have a little bit of top-down control because you're expecting something. So any sensation is immediately going to cause a withdrawal reflex. Likewise, you can also inhibit reflexes. So if you know it's coming and you know it's probably not going to hurt you, you can suppress your reflex to it. So for example, if you're walking through a haunted house at Halloween and you know that a zombie is going to jump out from behind a shower curtain then you can re repress your startle reflex that would normally happen if you didn't know it was there. And then you could just not react, which is what some people will do. And sometimes if you go to a horror film and you're thinking, oh yeah, I know what's going to happen next, and all the rest of the audience is doing that because something scary just happened, well, you can repress that reflex as well. So you do have some top-down control over over some of these reflexes. All right, so we've already talked a little bit about that, but reflexes, as we've also seen, for example, the patellar reflex, are things that physicians can test to see if there is normal 
central nervous system function. So if for some reason you have damage to the central nervous system, then you might see an absence of some of these reflexes. So let's say you have somebody who's had sciatica for many, many, many years, and they may be missing the uh, Achilles tendon reflex. So they you may not be able to make their foot jump by hitting the Achilles tendon, for example. And there are other reflexes that may be missing or attenuated in people who've had damage to certain regions of the spinal cord. So then we have one that's famous called the Babinski reflex. And this is something that we see in infants. And basically when you scrape the bottom of their feet, they'll splay their toes. And a normal person will usually curl their toes. So an adult, I should say, will curl their toes if you scrape the bottom of their foot and an infant will splay their toes. Now this is one of those reflexes, the curling of the toes, the plantar reflex, is one of those that takes a little bit of time. It's innate, but it doesn't develop until after birth when the connections from the, the motor neurons have to be made. So we're gonna have to, to finish making connections of the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. We're going to have to continue making these and building these connections after birth. And this will be programmed so that we will curl our toes. However, in an infant, these connections have yet been made. So our neurons then will react to splay the toes. Now somebody with spinal cord damage who has lost some of these descending connections will now revert back to the Babinski sign. So or the Babinski reflex, which is the splaying of the toes that we see in infants. So oftentimes if somebody comes to the ER and they've been in a car accident and there's any implication of spinal cord damage, this is one of the first things that a physician may do is see what this, their reflex is here.